Full Metal Jacket is a strange film, a strange masterpiece, and the same description could be said about many other Kubrick creations. It feels more like two novellas than one complete novel. The story set on Paris Island has thematic connections to the story in Vietnam, but the character focus and tones are much different. In order to properly dissect the ideas of Full Metal Jacket, it's best to look at both pieces of the puzzle separately. And that is the journey we're going to set off on today, and our guide is going to be none other than Gomer Pyle himself, Leonard Lawrence. The story of Boot Camp, which I'm just going to call the story of Paris Island, is very unique from a storytelling perspective. For one, we know the goals of every single character we meet. Every recruit's goal is to fight through training and become a Marine, so their personalities fall to the wayside. Their distinct identities fall to the wayside. They are at Paris Island to become killers, killers that eventually can work together to become one destructive organism. And this is shown right from the get-go as they all receive buzz cuts. The goal of Hardman is as straightforward as his recruits. He's supposed to make these young men ready to wage war. That's it. We don't know the background of any of these characters. We don't know how moral they have been up to this point. We don't know their family history. The only thing we can know about these characters is how capable they are of reaching the single goal they're meant to achieve. And it's for that reason why Pyle is a character worth focusing on. Pyle is the only character we see struggle on Paris Island, so he's distinct in that sense. But it's also worth pointing out that there is no reason to consider Pyle to be the quote-unquote moral outlier of this group. Again, we know nothing about Pyle's past. We never get a scene where the other recruits are doing something bad and Pyle tries to intervene. So I don't think Pyle's story is strictly about the duality of man, because we certainly see the evil at the end, but we never actually see the good. So if Pyle isn't the moral grounding, what is he exactly? What function does he serve? Well, I think the best word to describe Pyle is childish. It's fair to assume that his mental capacity is closer to a child's than to a young man's. He's unable to discipline himself, he depends on others for help, and the actor does a brilliant job showing this, when Joker is teaching him how to lace his boots and how to do the drills, he looks like a 10-year-old trying to mimic his dad. Hartman mocks this obvious trait of Piles at many different points in the film, and the sympathy that the viewers, including myself, feel for Pyle, it doesn't come from his morality, because again, we don't actually see it. It's the childlike innocence that's really hard to see snuffed out, because children can't regulate their emotions, they do a lot of terrible stuff, but they're kids and you take that into account before you punish them. Now, to be fair to Hartman, he has a job to do. The U.S. is in a war, and he's supposed to create weapons capable of winning that war. You don't want to send soldiers out there who act like this. And if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you instantly get that terrible feeling. I can hardly even look at the guy. It's one of the most frustrating scenes in cinema history. But the point is, as Hartman says, if your killer instincts are not clean and strong, you will hesitate in the moment of truth. You will be a danger to yourself and your fellow soldier. And the strategy Hartman uses on Pyle is similar in many ways to what Fletcher does to Neiman in Whiplash. In fact, some scenes are almost directly parallel. Oh, yes, sir! What side was that, Private Pyle? Sir, right side, sir! One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Rushing or dragging? Rushing. So you do know the difference! Now, there are some differences in the two stories, but both Hartman and Fletcher fail to consider what Pyle and Neiman will need to forfeit to become what they want them to be. Neiman's transformation is victory for Fletcher. Hartman gets something else. As entertaining as Hartman's attempts to improve Pyle are towards the beginning of the film, things really start to get interesting once Joker enters the picture. After Joker impresses Hartman by sticking to his beliefs, he appoints him to help Pyle. And Joker tries to be the good cop to Hartman's bad cop. Unlike Hartman, he teaches Pyle like a parent or a teacher would teach a child. He's patient with him, he doesn't raise his voice or insult him, and you really do want this method to succeed, or at least I did. It does seem like Pyle is making progress under Joker's tutelage, and in a conventional story, he probably would graduate with Joker and eventually meet him in Vietnam, and then they would fight in a battle or something, but Kubrick works against the viewer's expectations at many points in Full Metal Jacket, which I'll talk about more in part two, but Pyle's continual failure is probably the biggest misdirection on Paris Island. 
And before I get into the infamous jelly donut scene that changes the course of the story, I do want to mention a quick quote from Hartman. Your rifle, it's only a tool. It is a hard heart that kills. Some men arrive at Paris Island with hard hearts. It could be the result of genetics or upbringing, maybe both. And that makes their learning curve much smoother. Pyle arrives with a very soft heart. He's as far from Hartman's ideal as one could possibly be. And that raises an interesting question. How can such a dramatic transformation occur? Is it possible to simply harden the shell of Pyle's soft core, but keep the core of who he is intact? Or does the core itself need to be altered? In Apocalypse Now, Kurt suggests that soldiers can activate their primordial instincts while remaining moral men. In other words, they can harden their shells, but keep their core what it was before the war began. Full Metal Jacket shows that Kurtz's theory, it is not viable for someone like Pyle. Such an evolution requires the core to be permanently changed. So Pyle reverts to his childlike tendencies by swiping a donut from the mess hall, and he gets deservedly excoriated by Hartman. Unfortunately for Hartman, it is in this scene that he seals his own death warrant. I have tried to help him, but I have failed. I have failed because you have not helped me. You people have not given Private Pyle the proper motivation. Punishing the rest of the recruits for Pyle's screw-ups is a last-ditch effort by Hartman to convert Pyle, but it's not well thought through. Because he doesn't know what they'll do to Pyle, he probably doesn't even care, but he should have. Because not only did he give them reason to hate Pyle, he also gave them an excuse to do something evil. And that excuse would be, this is the only way he'll learn. Most of these men are not sociopaths. They need an excuse to do what they do later on. And Hartman gives it to him. The next day, Joker is literally buttoning up Pyle's shirt, like a mother getting her kid ready for school. And Pyle is aware of the situation he's in. He knows frustration is building and he tells Joker, I keep screwing up, I need help. And Joker gives a reasonable response, which is, I've tried. I've really tried. And he has. Pyle should have learned to become more tenacious, but it's clearly adverse to his nature. The turning point for Pyle is, of course, when the other recruits torture him. And the worst part of it is that Joker actually joins in on it. Now, Joker has more reason than anybody to be angry with Pyle. But he also knows Pyle better than anyone. And he knows they're basically torturing a child here. And I think Hartman's excuse of, this is just what he needs, that's probably the reason why Joker eventually strikes Pyle, even though he doesn't really want to, along with the peer pressure and frustration. And it's just a horrendous scene to watch, just the way he says, ow, it's so much worse than just screams and groans, because it's very innocent, and Joker can't take listening to it, I'm not sure I could for any longer than the scene was. Pyle's descent into madness does not take long after this event. The pain, the betrayal, that's enough to send somebody over the cliff. But there are also a couple of scenes between the beating and the final scene that I think are worth mentioning. The direction to kill is constantly drilled into the minds of the soldiers, but it's usually balanced out by anti-communism and our enemies, stuff like that. But there is one scene that sort of dilutes the we're training you to kill commies message. And it's easy to dismiss because it's a really funny scene. Do any of you people know who Charles Whitman was? None of you dumbasses knows. As the scene continues, Hartman brags about the marksmanship skills of Charles Whitman and Oswald, being that they were Marines. But it's not the best message for Pyle at this moment, since he had just been tortured and betrayed. Whitman and Oswald were killing American citizens outside the realm of war and they're praised for their killing abilities. So in other words, Hartman is glorifying the art of killing itself, which is just another reason for Pyle's conscious to deactivate. Now Pyle does end up becoming the soldier Hartman wanted him to become. He's drilled, he's a great marksman, he's born again hard, and he ends up making the infantry. But there is a cost to this transformation, and I'm really excited to get back to the question I asked earlier, because I'm gonna make a comparison here to a TV show that I think replicates Pyle's situation almost perfectly. The attempts to put a shell around Pyle's soft core were not successful. These attempts would be from Hartman and Joker. 
The only way for Pyle to become a true killer like Animal Mother is to completely alter his core. And that is done when he is tortured by the other recruits and betrayed by Joker. Now there is a line by Hartman as Pyle is devolving into insanity and that line is, We don't want robots, we want killers. And this is the perfect line to take you into a different story, which may seem completely separate from Full Metal Jacket, and that story is Westworld. If you haven't seen Westworld, I'll give you the quick information that you need to know, and I would recommend the first season because it is brilliant. So long story short, humans create a world full of robots, which are called hosts. They are nearly identical to humans, and humans use it sort of like a hedonic theme park. And the personalities of the hosts are broken down into different traits, and given different levels of intensity. Eventually, the hosts revolt and go to war with the humans. The leader of the hosts is Dolores, and she's very brutal and very unforgiving to the humans. But the same cannot be said for Teddy, who is designed to be her love interest for the theme park storylines. He's a decent man, he's compassionate, kind. But when the war begins, Dolores needs him to be something different. So she changes him. She goes into Teddy's system and maxes out his cruelty, self-preservation, decisiveness, loyalty, and tenacity. And Dolores achieves her goal. Teddy becomes the ruthless killing machine that she wanted, but after a little time, something doesn't go right. And Teddy brings Dolores to a secluded area, and the following events take place. Spoilers obviously are incoming. You changed me. Made me into a monster. I made it so you could survive. What's the use of surviving if I become just as bad as them? I can't protect you anymore. There's a comment for that video that articulates things really well, so credit to Tommy Toa, I think I'm saying that right for this comment. So he said, You can't force someone to change, especially the core of who they are, even machines. Teddy is a good guy by nature. She turned him into something he inherently despises. As I mentioned at the beginning, we don't know precisely what Pyle was before coming to Paris Island, but it was very far from what Hartman wanted him to be, obviously. So in order for him to change, the core of who he was had to be completely rooted out and replaced by something else. It's like they put a new heart into him, but the body didn't accept it. And the same thing happens to Teddy. Dolores thought she could alter his nature without consequences, but she was wrong. And so was Hartman. But only Hartman paid the ultimate price. I'm always looking for universal messages in film, I think that's the point of art. And although most people won't end up in an environment like Paris Island or military boot camp, we'll all end up in a place that requires us to adapt a little bit. It's just human nature. And usually we'll be able to change our shells a little bit and maintain the core of who we are. But sometimes events can transpire that threaten to alter the core itself. And in those situations, tread lightly because you never know what you'll eventually become. So that is part one of Full Metal Jacket. If you enjoyed and are interested in part two, remember to subscribe on your way out. And if you're into the war film genre, you can check out a video I've already made on Apocalypse Now, if you consider that to be a war film. Anyways, thank you so much for stopping by. Have a great rest of your day. I will talk to you soon.